Hello everyone, yep. my name is Katie King and before we get yeah. stuck into the presentation, I just want to set the scene. Um, following on from Kimberly's talk, there's a lot, there'll be a lot of overlap which I think just shows the huge potential that space and healthcare have. Um, but just setting the scene, statistically speaking, half of us here in this room will develop cancer in our lifetime, which is a very scary fact. Now, for treatment, currently, we will have to go to hospital and spend four to six hours receiving this treatment into our vein. Now, this is not just a huge financial burden, but a huge time burden as well on us, the patients, and the healthcare providers. We have to go back every month or so to receive the next dose. But what if I told you that space and manufacturing these pharmaceuticals in space could hold an answer to decrease that burden. Decrease that burden away from the healthcare system and increase a patient's quality of life. Now, my company, BioOrbit, we're building a pharmaceuticals factory in microgravity to make this vision possible. So today, I'm gonna to speak very briefly about how we make pharmaceuticals on Earth, then about how space affects this and why, what effect that has on healthcare, and my predictions for the future. So, very, very simplistic overview of how we make pharmaceuticals now. It's a lot like cooking. So I don't know who of you, show of hands, who's like, would consider themselves a cook, a bit of a foodie. Exactly. We, we all have a bit of food. And as, so when it comes to cooking, you need your ingredients in the exact quantities and you need to add them all at the right time, different temperatures, um, and cook them at the right temperature for a certain amount of time to get your masterpiece, your output. Any slight tweak in any of those conditions results in a different output. You know, when you put too much spice in, it can ruin the whole dish. And once we have that recipe for that pharmaceutical, we then need to think about scale up. And again, into cooking, if you make a small cake and a big cake, those conditions don't translate exactly the same. Temperatures can change, time changes. Um, so yes, it's very, very similar to that. And I'll come back to this scale up point. But if we think about this cooking pot, there's another variable that we can add in other than just ingredients, time, temperature. And that is gravity, a variable that we can play with. So on the ISS over the last few decades, there have been a plethora of experiments to see how the absence of gravity affects our world. What can we learn about our systems and healthcare through removing gravity? Now, I have just put a couple of things up here that... Um, that are affected in healthcare and where anti-gravity, or sorry, microgravity can then help. So as Kimberly was speaking about the genes side of things, this has huge potential as gene expression and cell signaling acts very differently in a microgravity environment. And that's something I always just find mind blowing. Life as we know it has evolved always in the presence of gravity. So if you remove it, what happens? Things might start to change. Kind of makes sense, but it still blows my mind. The other side is to do with this accelerated aging, so disease progresses faster. So theoretically, if you could find a drug that can slow down that progression in a microgravity environment, then that should help to slow down the progression of disease back on Earth. It's a great simulator for that accelerated process. And the other side is with 3D cell culture. So when we are looking and doing a lot of the drug discovery, it involves 2D cell arrays, which aren't a very good model for how the body responds. So we want to build these 3D cell cultures to get a better idea of how the body will respond to these drugs. But doing that on Earth can be problematic because these 3D cultures start sedimenting down, become squashed by gravity. But if you form them in microgravity environment, so organoids, spheroids, tumoroids, they are more free to form a better structure that we can then study. So I just find these fascinating. This all has effects and a, a downstream effect for healthcare. But the thing that's the most critical for pharmaceutical manufacturing is the effect on crystallization. Now, this is very much a materials problem, which I find obviously very interesting, dedicating a lot of my time to it. So on Earth, when a crystal is growing, a molecule has to get into the right position. And when it does so, it releases a little bit of heat and that causes tiny convection currents around that growing crystal. When it gets to a certain size, it's big enough that sedimentation will take over and pull it to the bottom of the vessel. And what that means is that there's a load of motion around this growing crystal, 
which causes, that means the next molecule struggles getting in that optimum place, which results in a load of imperfections, which you can see in yellow here. We get lots of imperfections and a wide range of sizes, which isn't great. But if we do exactly the same process in space, where you don't get convection currents, you don't get sedimentation, now you can get a far more perfect crystal, much more uniform. So this has been demonstrated time and time again on the ISS. But these, it looks like mush, it is not mush. And this is one of the most exciting examples, which was the crystallization of a drug called Cotruda, which is the world's best-selling drug. If you're interested, the revenue is over 20 billion annually for just this one drug. So if you crystallize this drug on Earth, it's a bit of a mess. There are loads of different sizes and there are loads of imperfections. But when this experiment was done in microgravity, you can see the uniformity here. Much more uniform, much more perfect crystals. So you might be asking, OK, well, that's all well and good. What's that got to do? How does that benefit the healthcare system? So I'm now going to take a step back to that scene that I set right at the beginning. Our current treatment is intravenously. These antibodies, like this drug Cotruda, has to be given into the vein. And this is very painful, and it takes a long time. But if you form a simple subcutaneous shot of exactly the same drug, treatment can now move to home, and we can inject and treat ourselves. So I don't know if any of you know of diabetics, and they inject with insulin. It's the same principle. And to bring about this effect, we need crystals, uniform reproducible crystals of that active ingredient. And indeed, diabetics inject with tiny crystals of insulin. So we want to bring this whole effect and this whole paradigm shift to the treatment of cancer. And for that, we need this uniformity that we could see in space, but we couldn't see on Earth. So then the question is, all right, we, need to, we can only create this thing in space. That needs to be mass manufactured for us to see all of the benefits here on Earth, which kind of sounds a bit sci-fi, but it's not. Now is the time for this production. And that is because accessibility to space has never been easier. SpaceX has completely changed the whole infrastructure. The cost of launch is so much cheaper than it ever used to be. And that's all well and good for getting things up there. But for all these products, we need to return them safely to Earth. And that's where it gets really exciting. Because now we have several re-entry vehicles that are being tested this year to return things safely back down to Earth. And there are a few companies I've mentioned here the exploration company will be hearing from Helen later today, which I'm very excited about. And so once this infrastructure is really stable, we have that loop. What's missing is the cooking appliance for the mass manufacture of these crystals. And that's what we're doing, making this effectively microwave. It's not microwaves, but it's about that same size. So we're building a space-optimized crystallization platform designed with this mass manufacture in mind. So it's miniaturized. I know when we think of factories, you think of those colossal buildings and think, how the hell are you going to get that into space? So first of all, it's miniaturized. And with half the size of a microwave, we can produce around about a kilo of these crystals every month. And so it's small, but it's definitely mighty. It's been built with scale up in mind so that going back to the cake analogy, the conditions for a small cake are still applicable to the conditions for a large cake. And that really changes changes the system and that's what we're building here and to make the most of the infrastructure and how that's changing in the space industry our little microwave needs to be able to be hosted on these re-entry vehicles and also on these space stations that are coming and so by working with the re-entry vehicles we can get that frequency and iterative approach to really like optimize all of the conditions and then when we want to go to mass manufacture it's about renting space sounds simple, just rent some space, um, on the space station for our microwave, and we go into 24-7 production at that point. So at BioOrbit, we're doing our in-orbit demonstration next year, which I'm very excited about, on the ISS, and then we'll be moving to adapting that for uh, the re-entry vehicles before going and renting our final space on one of the commercial space stations. So this brings me on to my prediction for the future and I predict that we will have permanent pharmaceuticals factories in microgravity by the end of the decade. This might first look like just that rented space, but I see it not too far 
further in the future, we will have permanent different fixtures that are more like the factories you imagine on Earth floating in microgravity. And it's because of that, my vision is that cancer patients will then be able to stay at home, treat themselves, because we have managed to harness the benefit of microgravity for making these drugs. And that is why we should produce pharmaceuticals in space. Thank you.